The title of today's sermon is God's Grace, Not the Way We Naturally Think. And today we're going to look at God's economy, at God's grace, which again is so different than the human economy, if you will, and of how we humans do things. So, and sometimes God's grace, many times God's grace is actually offensive uh, to us as people. So Mike is going to come and do the scripture reading for us. It's going to be from Matthew 10, 1 to 16 in the ESV version. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. These are the living words of God. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us about your grace. Amen. Again, as human beings... When we think and we read about God's grace, we oftentimes have difficulty understanding and accepting God's grace because it's so different than how we think. And there are many examples in the Bible that demonstrate this. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at, at some before we get into the parable of Matthew 15, uh, in Matthew 20, I mean. For example, in the at the end of chapter 15 of the book of Exodus, we, uh, we read there that Moses directed the Israelites to set out from the Red Sea. They had been delivered very powerfully by God through a series of incredible miracles to walk away from that oppressive system. And so... From the Red Sea, they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they came to a place called Mara. And there, they could not drink the water because the water was bitter. And guess what the Israelites did? They forgot everything that God had done, because as, as, as people, we have a tendency to live in the moment. And so we tend to, if, and if there's problems in the moment, we tend to forget what God has done for us in the past. What happens in the present just becomes amplified, kind of drowning out or hiding what God has done. So, so what did they do? They complained, they grumbled. Because they were wondering, are we gone? Are we all going to be die of thirst? Are we, are going, to, are we going to be able to drink water? We're, we're in this place, God-forsaken place, they, they probably thought, and there's no water. And so God, in his gracefulness, did not say, you bunch of losers, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. You already you have such a short memory that I, I can't work with you. No, God did not do that. God showed Moses a log and he told Moses, throw it in the water, 
and the water is going to become drinkable. It's going to become sweet. And everybody had enough to drink. The cattle, the children, the adults. And God intervened in his grace. And then in chapter 16, as we read on, they set out for Elam. And they came to the, the wilderness of sin. And again, there, they complained about the food. And what did they do? They, re they forgot about how treacherous life was in Egypt, and they just remembered what they ate. Because they were hungry, they, they were in the moment. Well, or they were hungry, or I don't know, the Bible doesn't say that. Maybe they were worried about where the next meal would come from. So they began to grumble again, just forgetting what God has done in their lives. And we can identify with that because as people, when we hit trouble, it tends to take all the place and we forget how God has been so gracious to us in the past. And so that's what they did. And they grumbled and they complained. And they said, you know, what about Egypt? We'd like to go back there. Why God did not, why did God take us out of Egypt to let us die here in this forsaken place? So what did God do? God sent them manna, food from the sky, for 40 years. And when they complained, God did not say, well, I'm going to strike you all dead. He didn't say that. He sent the manna. The manna and he sent them quail, meat, because they, they, were, they were really yearning for meat. And God sent them plenty of, of, of quail, and we read in places in the Bible where they, done, they did that. They ate so many quails that they got sick. Now, was it God's fault that they ate too much? Of course not. God, in his grace, fed them, and he because he was working for them. And, and we can say, well, you know, we can expect that they, were, that they reacted that way because they were rebellious people, stiff-necked, stiff the Israelites were. But really, what happens is that the Israelites are no different from the rest of humanity because that's the way we tend to react as well. The ten, that's the, tender way, the, the way we tend to react to difficult situations. When God said, you know, it, you know, in this life you're going to have trials. It won't, it won't always be easy. You'll have to, there'll be sacrifices in following me. You know, there's a cross to bear every day. But in all of this, we see God's graciousness with them. And we see God's graciousness with us. God fed them for 40 years. Every day he gave them manna until they got to the, the promised land. In sp spite of their attitude, you see, God did not give up on, on the Israelites. God continued to work with them. And they suffered as a consequence of their disobedience, of course, because God had told them, you know, had given them a choice. If you obey me, you're going to be, you're going to have a good life. If you disobey me and, try, and go your way, you're going to have a miserable life. And so what did they do? Well, as human beings, rather than trust God, as they were walking in these other nations, they began to, as we look at the, the, the history of Israel, they began to envy what the other nations had. What well, they seem to have a much better life than we do, and all of that. So what did they do? They forsook God. They forsook God. They went their own way, and they went and they and they and they offered to idols. They served idols of wood, pieces of materials that cannot do anything. And even if their prophets were sent to them, they would sometimes repent. But we, in all of that, we in all the background, we always see God's graciousness working with them, like He's working with us. So, so we see the, the example of 
of the Israelites how difficult it was for them to accept God's grace. How easily they forgot how graceful God, what God really is. And there is good news because as human beings we tend to be that way as well. But God, what God, what God does is that he gives us his Holy Spirit. He sent his son to live for us in our place to undo all of our sinfulness. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to live in us, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, to strengthen us. And because we have other examples, we say, well, you know, the Israelites, they were not converted. But could it happen to converted people? Well, let's look at the example of Jonah. Jonah was a reluctant prophet. And God told him, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went on, to, on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, we're going to see why Jonah ran away to Tarshish, it was not necessarily primarily because he feared the, Nin the, the people living in Nineveh, which was the city, it was the capital of Assyria. It was because God wanted to tell them of their evil ways and to turn to them. So Jonah said, you know, God, I don't want that. So he ran, he ran the other way. And we need to realize that it was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Assyria. It was founded by Nimrod, as the concise Bible dictionary tells us. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us very much about how it progresses. Uh, it, was, it was doubtless comparatively small at first, but nothing is related to its progress until Jonah was sent about 1,300 years later, its founding, to threaten its destruction. It was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, probably signifying its circumference. A three days' journey is estimated by Niebuhr to be about 90 English miles. So to go around Nineveh, it was about 90 miles. So it was not a small city, it was a big city. And so, and, and the online Bible, the, online, the uh, concise Bible dictionary from the on online Bible edition says, Nineveh may be regarded as typical of the world in its haughty pride, glorifying in its, proud, in its prowess. And so it's no different today. What we hear today, nations saying that they're the greatest and really glorifying in what they're able to do. But we need to realize that Jonah is mentioned before in the Bible. He's mentioned in 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And he was a prophet to Israel. Now, he didn't mind, apparently, going, he didn't mind going to prophesy to the people of Israel because they were his own people. And it's, he wanted the, the best for his own people. So what God told Jonah to go tell the Israelites to repent and to teach them about God, Jonah went voluntarily because he went to his own. He loved his own. But obviously he did not love the Assyrians. The Assyrians were seen as enemies. And Jonah, obviously, as we read from the book of Jonah, the, he had a very disdain, he had a very conde condescending attitude towards them. He, he did not want their best. He thought, you know why? They should suffer the evil that they're doing. They're an evil nation, and I don't want to go talk to them. 
I don't want to bring God's message to them because I know who God is and I know God's intention and I can't see from God's, I, I can't understand God's grace towards them. Maybe that's what he was thinking within himself. So he, so he ran away. And this is why he ran away, it says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? And so, God talked to him and he tells, he tells God why he ran away. <laughs> because he knew God's character. He knew that God was a loving God. He knew that God loved people. And he did not agree. And afterwards, Jonah, in self-pity, being angry, desiring to die, feeling very depressed because things were not going his way. He said he, he built a little shelter and uh, to get some shade from the sun. And God, in his graciousness, caused the plant to grow that, caused it, that, that gave him some shade. And he enjoyed it for a day. And then during the night, or sometimes God caused a worm to attack that plant, and the plant died. And it was hot, and it was windy, a hot, windy day. And Jonah started to feel self-pity even more. I had shade, I have no shades, and all of that, no air conditioning, the electricity is gone, and all of that. So God asked, asked, asked Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, yes, I do. I, I do well to be angry enough to die. So sometimes as human beings, we can just take situations and we just blow them out of, out of proportion. Because there was two problems. He did not agree with God that if the, if the Assyrians repented, that God would save them, that, would, that he would preserve them. And also he looked after his, and in that attitude, everything becomes very negative. And so he began to, he became angry because angry enough to die, that he did not, that he had to be in the hot sun and all of that. So, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you not make it grow, which came into being a night, and it perished in a night. And I should not pity Nineveh, God said, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their rights from their left, and also much cattle. See, God loves all people. Jonah obviously did not have the same attitude towards the Assyrians as God did. And the commentaries that I read say that in, in Nineveh there was about 600,000 people at least living there when you count everybody. But the question is, can we identify with Jonah? Are there nations that we would prefer 
would not exist, that they would just be wiped off the face of the earth and for the problem to stop. Do we have difficulty praying for those people when God tells us to pray for all people? He tells us that in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. He says, First of all, then I urge you with that supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Why? Because God is a loving God. Because God loves those people that are very rebellious. His desire is that they would turn to him. And before it's all over, I believe they will. Most of them, unless some may be too rebellious and they'll just re re reject Jesus when he reveals himself to them. This is rejecting people on a, on a national basis. But we can also reject God's mercy on a personal basis. I won't go there today, but if we think of the, prof, the, the parable of the prod, prodigal son. The prodigal son went away and he went, to a, went into a far country, took in his, in his inheritance and squandered it all. And then he came back, and his father was very joyful. In fact, he ran towards his son when the son came back. So what did the older son do? The older son said, you know, I've been a good son all my life, and you've never treated me that way. And now your son, who's rebellious, who went to squander everything, already used up all his inheritance, he comes back and you throw a great big party. And the older son said, I'm not going. I'm not going. Because you did not treat me right. It's a very human reaction, isn't it? We tend to compare and say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. The father's not fair. Because he's too loving, he's too great, he's too merciful. And I guess that we can ask of ourselves, individually we can ask, and collectively we can ask, are there people that I feel are so bad that I think they're hopeless and that they cannot repent? In fact, I hope that they don't repent right now and don't come to our congregation because they are so difficult. And we can act like the oldest son in the parable and refuse to join the party. And it's easy to do that for each and every one of us. But God's doesn't think or operate that way. He loves all people. And in my years in ministry, I, see, I have seen situations like that where people got so upset that they say, I can't stand that person, and if he comes, I'm going to, I'm going to leave or, or I'm going to make so much trouble for him because, or her because they don't live to my standard. And I have seen that and experienced that and lived it and tried to encourage people to remember who God is. <laughs> you see, God does not operate that way. He loves all people. He doesn't say, you know, I have a type of eternal life for the good people and another type of eternal life for the troublesome people. Eternal life is the same for everyone. So let's turn to Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. And just prior to the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, in Matthew 19, we read, 
about people bringing little children to Jesus. And the disciple says, no, no, no. They are troublesome. Shoot them away. He rebuked the people. And Jesus corrected the disciples. And he said, in verse 14 to 15, he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he went away. Very trusting children are an example for us. Innocent, trusting. And then we read about the rich young man. He walked away. He was sorrowful. He was very rich. And he, God said, you know, like you, had, you need to detach yourself from your worldly possession to follow me. And the young man could not at the time. He just decided to walk away. And Jesus said to his disciples, he says, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. In other words, don't give up. But with God, all things are possible. And Jesus continued, and he said, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive the hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. See, God's economy is very different than our economy, isn't it? Very different. So in this parable, in Matthew 20, we read about a master of a house who hired people every hour of the day. And he said to the first one, you know, come to work for me, I'll give you a denarius, which was a day's wage for a laborer at that time. And, uh, and to, he told the others as he went in, because he wanted more workers, and he told them, you know, I'll give you whatever is right. The Bible doesn't say, I'll give you a denarius. He said, I'll give you whatever is right. And uh, so he began to pay them at the end of the day. And he said to the last one, he said, you know, I'm going to give you a denarius for the work done, even if you only work for one hour. And he paid the first one last. And he also got a denarius. So what do you think the human reaction is? Well, complain. In a human way, we would bring that to the union, wouldn't we? And so we'd say it's unfair. And we want equal pay for whatever. And we want to be paid fair, and we should be paid maybe 10 times more than the one who worked for one hour. We should get 10 denarius. But that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is to show God's graciousness towards everybody. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says the following. He says, take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity so that the last will be first and the first last? And we, we can ask ourselves, well, do we I begrudge God's generosity? In the back of my mind, 
because I have been a servant of Jesus Christ for a long time, do I think that I need, that I, I, I deserve a bigger reward than those, who, than those who will come at the last hour? You know, and as we read these parables, we need to remember God's eternal plan for people, for humanity. And we need to remember the hope that the Apostle Paul had. Because the Apostle Paul was instructed personally by Jesus Christ. And this is what he, he wrote, he said, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, because he was writing to the Gentiles in Rome, the, the, the Christians, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take their sin away. And then he goes on in verse 28, he says, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies of God, talking about the Israelites, for your sake. But as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. They, can't not, they will not change. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that, the, that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. So basically God was saying, Jesus told and instructed and he taught Paul, you know, that the Israelites did not understand who God is the Gentiles did. And he said, you think that these people might be lost forever, but they're not. God is going to gra graft them back in to the olive tree. That's what he said. And they're, they're fell into disobedience for your sake, so that you can understand. So, And we need to remember what Jesus did for all of us. You know, Karl Barth wrote in one of his books, uh, which is quoted in Fleming Rutledge's book on the crucifixion, he said, the heart of the atonement is the overcoming of sin. Sin in its character as the rebellion of man against God and its character as the ground of man's hopelessness, destiny is death. It was to fulfill this judgment of sin that the Son of God as man took our place as sinners. So Jesus took our place as sinners because we're all sinners. He fulfills it, the judgment, as man in our place by treading the way of sinners to its bitter end in death, in destruction, and in the limitless anguish of separation from God. We can say indeed that he fulfills this judgment by suffering the punishment which we all have brought on ourselves. We brought the punishment on ourselves because we deserted God as humanity. So Jesus came in our place and he took all of that on himself and he judged it out of love. The God the Father was not punishing Jesus. But Jesus accepted to bear all that guilt upon himself. And he felt the loneliness of sin on that cross. In our place. Our forsakenness. And Paul tells the Gentiles that he has, that God has the potential, has the, not the potential, but that God would graft the Israelites back in the tree again. And the point of all of this is that God's grace is limitless. It is limitless. You know, as human beings, we're not to put our own standards about how God should act or react or treat us. 
or treat humanity. You know, as God's people, we are to, pre we are to appreciate and be thankful for God's grace. Even if in our human eyes it appears to be incredibly unfair. Jonah knew that. He ran away from it. He said, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfastness, love, and relenting from disaster. But I, I know that if they repent, you will not punish Assyria. So, so we need to remember who God is. We need to cherish our calling very much so and rejoice that God is that that he is who he is and everyone is precious in his eyes and as God's people we are to welcome newcomers in our church communities with open arms and let God work with them The Bible tells us how to, man to direct the church and all of that, so I'm, I'm not saying that, but we are to be the warmest people. When people come in, do we keep talking to one another, ignoring the new people that come in? Or do we go towards them and feel them so, feel very welcome and say, you know, come and have a coffee with us after services or whatever, and have that kind of warmth, welcoming people, praying for them, because as God's people, that's what we are to do. And God desires that everyone would be saved and would participate in that loving relationship that God has, that God wants with all of humanity, with all those who would come to faith in Christ. So let us ask for the gift of repentance if where sometimes we don't see it, where we might not accept God's gracefulness, graciousness, and let's pray and rejoice that God's economy is so different than ours. And let's join the party because that's, there's more rejoicing when one sinner repents. There's a lot of uh, rejoicing in heaven with the angels. So let's join that party. Let's pray before we have communion. Father God, we pause before you at this particular time, so very thankful that your mercy and grace is so enormously beyond what we can think or imagine. You are grace, you are welcoming, you are warm, and your plan for humanity is that we enjoy the tremendous relationship in Christ that you've had for all eternity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. That we can indwell you and we, you indwell us in a miraculous way, that you are forming our character and changing us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to accept your grace. Help us to rejoice in your grace. Help us to participate in what you're doing. Help us to change our attitude. Help, show us where to repent. We, we know that repentance is a gift from you and we do want that gift and we want to receive it and we want to have your mind more and more, Jesus. And we ask this through your name. Amen.